Hey everyone, it's George Carlos and welcome back to another special edition monthly highlight video from April of 2022. And uh, sometimes I like to do these intros, sometimes I just kind of take a break from them. I don't feel maybe I just don't have anything to say. I talk a lot in this podcast, but I wanted to share something as I know many people are going into interview season. They're uh, applying for new jobs and this is not my advice, but advice I heard and I'll give my own little spin on it. You know, before we get into the incredible guests, guests that we had um, this last month, something I heard and it's a common question that you get in interviews is what questions do you have from us? And the response I heard, and I can't remember if it was just in conversations having, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, it's not mine, but I heard it and I wanted to pass it on to you is, um, what questions do you have from us? And a, a really great one is if I was to be successful in this position, what would that look like to you? And there's a couple of reasons I think that's a really powerful question. And the first one is it gets them to visualize you in the job. And I think that's part of the, the connection that you're trying to make is that how do they see, you know, you being successful? How do they see you in this position? But I also think it gives them an opportunity to really kind of define what that looks like. And then through their response, how do you actually validate that's what you would do? That's how you connect. And maybe to be honest with you, maybe you're like, oh, that's not something I want to do at all. And so it gives you kind of an out as well if you don't feel this is a position that, you know, would really tie to your strengths and connect. And so really kind of using that question to help them kind of visualize you in that position, but also, um, you know, give an opportunity to like say like, hey, what are you looking for and how do I, I fit that description and how can I actually, you know, emphasize how I fit that description. And this actually reminded me when I was starting my student teaching right before I became a teacher, there was an award that was given for the best intern of our class. And that was a terminology, I don't know, student teacher, whatever, um, you know, for my university class. And I asked my cooperating teacher on the very first day, probably about 10 minutes after meeting her, I said, hey, something that I'd really like to achieve is I would like to win this award. So in your eyes, what would that look like for me to get to that space, right? And I wanted her to kind of visualize, you know, to be honest, yeah, I did want to win that award. Uh, and, but I think it was more, I like, I wanted to excel above and beyond expectations. And so she described a lot of things for me that she'd like to see. And I wrote all those things down and I constantly went back to that list and went back to that space because first of all, I wanted to put it in her head. That's, something that I wanted to achieve in this process. But I also wanted to, you know, really kind of emphasize like, what are the things that she looks for that would make a really good teacher and use that space, whether I won the award or not, which it didn't, spoiler alert, <laughs> I didn't even, I was nominated, but I didn't win, not even close. But uh, it was just a really great way for me to kind of just figure out what are some things I need to do to be successful in this position. So I, I think about this, you know, maybe whether you're transitioning your career, maybe just starting your career. I just thought it was great advice that I wanted to share before um, I get into the incredible advice, thoughts, stories of my guests this month, because I know a lot of people, I, I've been in the position where, you know, I've been looking for jobs, I've been looking for new roles. And every opportunity we have to learn to become better to, you know, maybe, maybe you're in a role that you love, and maybe that's something you can modify in your own way to really um, think about like, how would this help me in my current role? How would this help my students in some way? I think every chance we have to learn. And so I wanted to pass that on uh, to you because um, I know when it's really hard to be stuck in a position and I've been there before. And so my hope is always to help people get to the space that they want to be at, not the space I hope they're at, but the space that they want to be at. And so I just heard that advice. I thought it'd be really valuable to share. And, uh, I, I hope I hope it helps someone out there listening. But other than that, you're gonna you're gonna enjoy um, the thoughts and, and ideas from my incredible guests this past month. But welcome back to another monthly edition of the best of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Now, whether you become an entrepreneur in terms of opening a business, you should become an, an entrepreneur and in understanding that you are a business of one. And what do I mean by that is, yes. let's say let's say you're an educator. You go to your district and you soak up every 
piece of PD they offer. If it's letters training, if it's order getting ham, if it's schoology, if it's camps, whatever, you soak it up and you take those skills, you make them applicable to what you're doing and you put them aside in your toolkit, right? You are a business of one. And when right. your district no longer serves you, right, don't be afraid to leave and go somewhere else and you take those skills that you've learned from them for free right. somewhere else. Now, whether that becomes you starting your own consulting company, you're going to go work for Canvas as, as a, a trainer for them. Uh, or you just, move again, move on to another school district where their values more align with yours or where, where you can see a, 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 a clearer path for growth for yourself. You do that. But we have educators as well as other workers who languish in jobs. Right. Because they get attached to the job. They get attached to the paycheck and not understanding as a business of one, you actually are in control of where you go right. because your employer will let you go when it is best suited for them. Right. Yep. Or yep. if, for example, a school district, which, you know, normally we don't, you know, school districts normally are not the places where you hear about a lot of uh, job cuts. However, when budget cuts come, you could be the one on the chopping block because they don't have the money for your salary. So old thinking was, was, you know, it, it's like, like, like the hockey coach idea, every three to five years, move them on. They, they come in with a burst of energy in a new site. They get everybody excited. Yeah. But what I know is happening on the back end is lots of the staff are going, we've seen this game. We've seen this right. before three years from now, we're going to get somebody new, different flavor, different level of excitement. I'll wait it out. But mm -hmm. You know, now and and for principals to know, hey, if you say you're going to do something, I'm going to leave you there long enough that you actually have to do it. Right. And so um, I, I, we're like I'm finding that we are having maybe it's does it's not as flashy, but it's more it's more sustainable. The changes that we're making because administrators are more consistent in their positions. OK, so I, so this is actually something that I'm really kind of adamant about. Uh, one of the things I struggle with that I watch in education is I, like, obviously, you, you know, we've talked a lot about my work in innovation and, you know, I talked about that and I, it's weird because I'm actually very anti latest and greatest. Let's do the new thing. Cause I'm like, we never got good at the old thing, right? Like give right. me some time. And so when I actually look, so like when I'm actually looking at the process of how you're doing it, I act weirdly enough having somewhere that are longer, I actually feel that's when you can do the more innovative things because you have to set up some like basic things that in your school. And really when I'm looking at innovation, it's about depth. It's actually not about the new, like it's not about attaching to the new thing. Right. And like, have you found like through this process, having, you know, there's those relationships kind of building long-term that it actually has maybe helped you to, you know, really do some things that maybe kind of put, cause I know that you, you, you've done some like interesting things in your school district and a lot of people like kind of look to it, but having that consistency, does it actually lend to innovation in any way? Yeah. It, 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 I think you're exactly right. It's, it's so funny that way. I think, you know, right from, you know, me being in the job for more than a decade, you would think that we would, you know, that you can actually still have an innovative, you know, an innovative mm -hmm. mindset as you might like to have. Mm -hmm. Do I get it? Do I get a, a horn for that? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, That's all I got. <laughs> oh. That's if button that was ready. So, but I'll give you that. I got it. All right. So, <laughs> you know, that you actually have that, um, you, you know, right from me being in the role yeah. that the, the whole, the whole piece around innovation, right. You know, through principles, I have, I think you're absolutely right. Because also then I have time that if we make a mistake, you have time to fix your own mistakes right. and go to, and, and then live with them. And then, yeah. and then, Create something new. You're not just like fixing the last, you know, man or woman's mistakes who are in the role, and then and then being gone, and then the next person going in and going, oh, I just inherited a mess, and I got to clean it up. Everybody <laughs> always says they got to clean up for no the last. Never person. said that. That's never been said. Everybody, right? And so, right, right. you know, in our in our schools, I'm trying to let you have let you have your own mess you can clean up. Right, and that, and that I think that that to me is so important because I think there is that disconnect and. And I think for to be, and it's interesting because I, I think like you, I've evolved in that thinking, right? I, yeah. I don't know if I would have said the same thing 10 years ago, right? You know, like it is good to like have, you know, new ideas and stuff like that too. But I think part of the reason why 
um, a lot of those places that have consistency in the leadership uh, are innovative because you have relationships. You know, you know, people got your back if something does go wrong and that they can kind of help guide through it. But if, you know, if you're new to the role, I don't really know you. I, I kind of just want to toe the line, do what you kind of ask me. And then, like you said, wait it out to the next person. I'm going to do what they're doing. I don't think it gives anyone, you know, kind of that, that consistency. So I, I, I actually love that. Right. And it's, I, I, it's funny because I think kind of, as you said, I don't think we've been having this conversation this way 10 years ago. No, I, for sure not. I agree. Right. right? And I think that, that to me, you know, I, I hope, you know, I hope I, you know, and maybe uh, who we'll see what happens in 10 years. If we actually still believe in that, that way too, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question and I swear this was you, but if it isn't, then you got to pretend it was you okay. and make this up. I swear that in an interview, you tweeted a question out and asked for help. Am I right on this? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, uh, you, you, it's true. So this goes back. So this goes back to my, when I, when I was in the interview to become superintendent, Yeah. what they, what they did was, um, this is now what year? 2009. Right. So 2000, uh, October, yeah, October, like of 2009, I guess this is. And, and you had an hour to, they give you a question and then you had an hour and then you had to present to the board and fit with 15 minutes, sort of a succinct, you know, it was kind of, it was one of those, like, what does the next 10 years look like in education in our community? Kind like of an questions. hour before your interview? Is that so an hour before your interview, they give you the question so that you can prepare. If you want to make some slides, you want to write right. notes, and then you come in and make a presentation to the trustees. <laughs> yeah. And so as soon as I got the question, I posted it on Twitter. Yeah. Which was at the time was like, what are you doing? Like, you, right. why, why nice. are you cheating? Why are you cheating on the question? Right. And, and, and I, and then I, rather than, rather than present on the topic precisely what I went into the interview and said was, I go, you should, you should care less about what I think, but I want to tell you about how I'm going to go and get the best information. And one of the ways I'm going to do that is I'm going to leverage my network. And over the last hour, I put this, your question out to the smartest people I know. And right. here's some of the things they've told me what, what we should be talking about. And so, you know, that notion that when you hire, you know, it's, in the old age, it, it, it was like, you know, it was the, it was the network of people you went through university right. with or at the country club in our, in our, for you and me, the, our network has been our digital networks. And right. so when you bring us in, you're bringing your, our digital networks with you. Yeah. Cause like, it's like that old adage, it's not like, not, it's not who you, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. But it's kind of like, it's not what you know, it's who you're connected to. When do you kind of decide like, Hey, this is something that we need to stick with and get really good at versus like identifying when it's it is a problem maybe it isn't the best direction for us to go because i think you know like i i try to there's a lot of things i've been doing over and over and over again for years and they get progressively better and there's things that i absolutely love doing but i've also um i kind of sometimes when i feel like hey this isn't working for me anymore i'm okay to drop stuff like i'm okay to move on from it so how, how do people kind of identify the difference between those two things so i think for me, I and I spent a lot of time talking about this, starting friction is a huge thing. Um, you know, when you are starting something new, you're literally rebuilding the pathways and creating more connections in the way that you now need to think. And it's so funny that you say that because like right now, my kid's school is changing their math curriculum. Right, right. And they just changed their math curriculum. Like I've got a seven year old and they had just changed the math curriculum when my older one was approximately the same grade. So probably about six years ago. And I think that there is this fine line of taking data and recognizing when something isn't working mm -hmm. and also recognizing that at the beginning, you're not going to be that great at it. I often use the example of podcasting because I think podcasting is such a great example that people can really understand even if they're not podcasters. Um, I am not a podcaster. I just like going right. on people's other people's podcasts. But like if you're a podcaster, you know, you have to learn how to audio edit. You have to learn how to market. You have to learn how to ask insightful, interesting questions to keep both the person you're interviewing engaged as well as the audience, there's a lot of different skills involved. Well, 
if you look up how many podcasts the average podcast has, it's seven because wow. most people hit two, three, four and stop because they weren't aware of how much work it was going to be. But that work gets so much easier. Audio editing gets easier the more you do it. So I think that when you are at the beginning of a path, you have to recognize it's going to be a struggle. Like none of it's going to be rote. It's going to be hard. And you really have had to think through that this hardness was is going to be worth it for these reasons. But then you also have to be looking for is the hardness getting easier? Like is, and is there something wrong in my approach? Because I mean, with everything, you know, I had like, we've, the approach may or may not work for you. Like a lot of times we are, we like to throw the kitchen sink at it. Like I can do everything. And then you vastly under overestimate how much time you have. And so really focusing on your strengths to me is the best way to evaluate whether or not something is working. Like, is this using my strengths? Right. Is this using my core competencies? Am I seeing a trajectory where this will become easier to implement? This will become what I need it slash want it slash hope for it to be. Like, for example, knowing students, here's a question right. for you. How do you, what are some suggestions or strategies for teachers to do this, right? Like, cause I know we can kind of dig into like, what does that mean? But like, what are some ways that teachers can do this where you have the Nick Sabans of the world and then, you know, uh, the opposite personalities, what are some ways that we can do that? Yeah. So, all right, I'm going to start with that last part first. Like if you, if, if the question is, how do I know my students better? Um, you have to be intentional about that. You have to talk yeah. to them. Yeah. And you have to ask them questions um, like uh, be be uh, be a student of your students. Right. Like ask them uh, things that aren't related to your subject area. Mm -hmm. What are your hobbies? What are your interests? What team are you on? Um, and, and then look, if you have a terrible memory like I do, well, then make a spreadsheet or keep notes like right. not don't interrogate the kid and write it down in front of them, but like, keep notes. And remember, uh, uh, George is really fascinated with college football. So right. after the game, look at him and say, Oh my gosh, did you see that interception? Right. That is knowing. And that provides a connection with him. And that itself won't make him learn math better, but it will lower his guard a little bit. It will, it will put him in a place where he can be receptive to the other things you do as part of teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and this is the thing, George, like humans are incredibly complex. So there isn't yeah. one thing to do. And you said earlier, different. Uh, so teachers need to, uh, there's nothing wrong with teachers having different personality types and different right. approaches themselves. So just cause you're gruff, doesn't mean you're hateful to kids, right? right? Right. And so maybe there are kids that that's what they actually connect with. So I want to say something I, I said on the short broadcast is if you treat, no matter what your personality is or your approach, if you treat each of your students with dignity all right. the time, then your style is fine. Right. Um, and, and to your to your bigger question, do these things hold equal weight? Like my research in the book wasn't intended to explore how these things interact with each other and which is more important. It, it, it's, it's meant, it was meant as an exploration, like to, to right. notice. Um, so what I would say is um, if you uh, describe someone, uh, so your example was someone who is good at instruction, right? really good at planning, but doesn't know how to know students, the right. argument would actually be they're not teaching. Right. Like that's not yeah, all that's right. of teaching. It's incomplete. That doesn't mean that it has no value. But then there are some things on here that the research and what the profession expects of a teacher, there are a couple of them that I think a lot of times get lost. I mentioned reflection earlier. We talk about the importance of reflection, but how many, how often... I don't know if you've ever heard of someone getting written up because they weren't reflective enough. 
Right. I mean, that would right. shock me. Like, no, you right. don't write someone up for that. You write them up because they're insubordinate because they didn't do their lesson plans or something like that. Right. But the church says, if you're not reflecting, you're not doing all of teaching. And, and, right. and that's really the point is there's, it's so vastly complex and there's a mismatch between the complexity of teaching and the rights and privileges that are afforded the professionals that do this. Other professions, you know, are, are very complex and then right. there's a better match. How, especially in the last couple years, you know, not mm -hmm. that you're obviously, and this is something, it's not like I know you well enough that you weren't like, oh, COVID, now let's start focusing on this. This is like, but <laughs> especially the last couple of years, like, what does that look like? What, what do you mean by that when you yeah. consider that? Well, I love that you just mentioned real quick. So what, what I'm doing now is not that much different than what I was doing. Mm. You know, the, so here's the fun fact. Six years, three before the pandemic, three technically in the pandemic, right? So that perspective, I think, is I reflect on that constantly. Before the pandemic started, I'd already talked to my staff about, um, you know, I, dare I say this because some, some will roll their eyes, but self-care. Right. And and right. and I said this and it's not a buzzword. It's not a buzzword on my right. campus. It truly means something. And I've been very adamant of and it means something different to every single one. Right. My self-care is not your self-care. Right. And and so forth. So I always encourage myself, whatever it is, whatever brings you that peace, whatever calms you down, whatever de-stresses and, you know, how you decompress, do that. Mm -hmm. intentionally and as often as you can. So we were already operating in that manner. I had, I would put out Google forms. I got this idea from a colleague and it's just like a check-in, like, Hey, how are things going on a scale of one to 10? Here's where I'm at. This is something that I'm super proud of. I went, you know, and my staff be like, I went jogging the, for the first time. And you know, this, you know, great. Awesome. So I was constantly checking in with them. I was modeling that myself. I was, you know, I know you got a wonderful fitness journey, but mm -hmm. I was on a fitness journey. I was doing, you know, going to the gym and and really working on my eating habits and and modeling that piece. And I yeah. always said family first. So when my older two weren't on my campus and they had a field trip, I would take a day off and go on the right. field trip with them because I'm a mom first. Mm -hmm. And I would have staff say, wow, you really get it. Like, thank you for modeling that. I don't feel guilty now because I'm taking care of my mother who's sick and I have to take a day off. Like, no, why Why do we make teachers feel guilty for taking care of their own? I just don't understand that. But so all of that continued with like a hyper intensity in the past two right. years, right? right? I mean, we literally just hit our two year anniversary of we left school one day, never knowing we were coming back to that in that manner, the rest of the school year. Um, mm -hmm. So those Google forms, I mean, that, those first couple of weeks of the pandemic shutdown, when we weren't in our buildings, we were on Zoom with our students. I was sending a weekly Google form, like, what do you need help with right now? What technology can we support you with? Like, what are you doing for yourself? Um, and you know, and getting that feedback. Now, here's the trick to those, though. When you get those responses, you got to respond back. Um, right. And I think right. that's where some administrators stop. They're just getting all that. No, this teacher just poured their heart and soul out. If I don't acknowledge that, what am I telling them? What's the value of them sharing that with me? So, you know, in that sense, that psychological safety, I think, is really important. And I, and I hope and I feel like I provided that for them. Mm 